Locked On Rays, your daily Tampa Bay Rays podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Rays podcast and Ulysses. Today, we have a very special guest, again, another special guest on the podcast, and that is Tampa Bay Rays relief pitcher, Colin Poche. Colin, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited. Well, first of all, it's January, so Happy New Year, Colin. How were the holidays? How did you spend uh, the holidays? Did you go somewhere? Did you stay in Florida? Tell us about that. Um, we actually stayed in Florida. Um, my wife and I, we actually got married in uh, November, so we we stayed at the house, and my family, my parents, my brother came in town, and you know we did Christmas here, so um, it was a really good holiday. It's good to see him, good to have him out in Florida, um, but I'm excited for, you know, 2022 and everything that comes with it well talking about 2022 let's talk about your progression to getting to 2022 uh Mm -hmm. you've been on the shelf with tommy john it's your second time Uh, Mm -hmm. i saw that you also had one in 2014 now has there been any difference between the first tj to the second one how's the the rehab progressing can you talk a little bit about that um, yeah, the, the rehab, the whole progress is, it's pretty much the same. Um, with your second one, everything's a little more drawn out. So I think the first one I was, you know, throwing after four months and the second one, you got to wait till six. So um, the timeline is just a lot wider. And so that, that brings its own set of challenges um, just mentally, you know, like just one, what, what do you do with the time and how do you, you know, make sure that you're actually getting better and progressing in your rehab um so the first one the first one wasn't as bad just being in college um you know I was with the team I was at Dallas Baptist um they were bringing me on road trips I was actually like the the bullpen coach down there so they gave me a job you know picking up the phones and getting guys warm um so you know I had something to do which was nice um the second one was was a little tough with COVID um, and the restrictions on, you know, guys being certain places, they kind of had, you know, we had a group of like five or six rehab guys that we kind of had to get in and out in the morning. So we were a little secluded from the team. So that, that makes it a little harder just to kind of, you know, stay focused and locked in mentally. But, um, you know, I can't say enough good things about the training staff we have. Um, Joe Benj, the head trainer, and Paul Harker is our, um, you know, major league medical coordinator who handles the rehab. And, um, Paul just really shows up for us every day, um, puts in so much work for all the guys, and you can tell he truly cares about it, which which makes the whole process a little bit easier. Now, being away from the team probably is not the thing that you want to hear uh, as a major leaguer. You, you, you get into a routine, and then that's taken away from you. I think we all got a little bit something of that taken away from us with, with COVID. But in your case particularly, what has been going on? I mean, ha- have you been – reading more have you been watching your netflix to do uh <laughs> shows are, are, you, are you a crazy video gamer what what have you yeah been kind of you know not not get stuck at home or something like a that? little bit of everything um i do like video games uh during the season was a lot easier because i would come home and you know watch the games um so that was nice to just try to stay locked in that way um last last december we got an eight week old puppy uh a golden retriever so that that's kind of how i've been trying to take up my time is playing with him and taking him on walks and all that stuff so i think that really helped a lot over the last you know almost two years now and and that's what you know that's what made it tough is i get hurt 2020 before that season so i'm away from the team that year and then the whole 162 game schedule i'm away from the team and so it's just it was tough because you get your identity gets so wrapped up in being a baseball player and, you know, going on road trips and just like the structured schedule that comes with it. And then, you know, when that's just gone from your life, it, it leaves just a huge time block that you don't really know what to do with yourself for a while. But, um, you know, on one hand, it, it was good to kind of get that mental break away from the game, but that lasted, you know, a month or so. And I was itching to get back out there, but, um, you know, so hopefully with, the lockout and everything that's going on, we can get started on time because I'm not really looking for any delays this year. Yeah. When you, I, I want to kind of see the the mind of a professional baseball player as a fan. I know what how I am as a fan. I sometimes mm. uh, drink a cold one. I, I'm sometimes <laughs> on Baseball Savant uh, while mm. watching the game. Maybe I'm on Twitter spilling out my yeah. thoughts about the game. What is Colin Poche as a fan 
uh, watching the games, uh, at least in 2021. How are you? Was it background noise or were you also on Baseball Savant or on Twitter? What what <laughs> is it like? Uh, when I'm watching the games, I, I do get pretty locked in on just kind of like what what the pitcher's thinking in certain situations and trying to figure out what the what the hitter is thinking. But I am actually a big Baseball Savant fan. Um, I found the uh, the random video feature where you can go and like you can load a random video and they have like just a random pitch or like you hitting a guy or a strikeout. So there, there were definitely days where I get stuck just reloading different K videos of myself to kind of just pretend like I'm back out there and get that yeah. feeling again. So I'm definitely guilty of, you know, kind of feeling myself through, through baseball savant when, when I need a little confidence boost. <laughs> Certainly, certainly. And Colin, going back a little bit, uh, when you found out, I guess, just want to make sure my timeline was right or is right. 2018 was when you were traded from the Diamondbacks to the Rays. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. May, May 1st of 2018. Okay. When you got that call or got the information that you had been shipped off to the Tampa Bay Rays organization, what were kind of your initial thoughts? Were was it sort of a little bit of nervousness or excitement or um, a little bit of mixed emotions, knowing that you are going to have to pack up and go to a new organization? Also knowing that the Rays are widely regarded as very influential and, and very pitching driven mm -hmm. and very, uh, I guess, state of the art and, and cutting edge when it comes to right. developing their pitchers and also a, a team, a franchise that isn't afraid to give playing time to young players. Just what was mm -hmm. kind of your emotions going through that on, on the day of that trade? Um, so at first it's, it's funny you say you got to pack up and move because uh, it was a pretty unique situation when I did get traded. Um, Montgomery, the Rays double A team was in town playing uh, Jackson, who I was playing mm -hmm. for at the time. So I got traded packed up my locker. Um, I walked through two doors and I was with my new team. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't your typical get on a plane and, you know, fly to your new team. It was just a couple doors down, but um, it was also, you know, pretty unique just, just because I was a player to be named later in that trade. So the, the actual trade was made, you know, months in advance. Um, and you know, word gets around. So in spring training, in spring training, they're even telling us with the D backs, like, you know, a couple of you guys are going, there's going to be scouts here. So it's just like a, a good reminder that no matter what team you're with, there's always 29 others that are watching. Um, and so as spring training goes on, you know, we kind of found out that there's a, there's a list of players who are on this player to be named later list. And so um, the Rays have scouts everywhere. So it's, it's pretty evident, you know, who's on the list. The scout is, you know, sitting behind the bullpen and a couple guys warm up and he doesn't move and I start throwing and he gets his video camera out and stuff. So <laughs> They're not too subtle about it, but um, as the date came came closer to when they had to make that pick, um, I had been throwing really well in double A. So, you know, I, I thought there was a good chance that I would get moved. And, uh, you know, when it actually happened, I was excited. Um, you know, you hear so many good things about the Rays development. And, you know, like you said, as a young player, you're going to get to play. Um, at the time, this was before, before the first 90 win season. So, you know, I was a little unsure of what of what kind of like team they had at the big league level. But um, I knew it would be a good chance for me to, you know, move up a level and start knocking on the door of the big leagues. So, um, you know, that's, that's what it's all about for a player. And so, you know, when, when I got that call, I was, I was just really excited to, to join the team and, you know, kind of find out the secret sauce, I guess, on, on how they get the most out of people. And, um, you know, it's not always what you think, but, but they do, they do a lot of things special here. And, uh, you know, one of the things they do is just keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. um, they find guys with with really good stuff, you know, high high vertical break fastballs or guys who can, you know, get the horizontal break on the fastball and um, just, just guys with outlier stuff of any kind who maybe had different issues with other organizations throwing strikes. And um, they basically just, just come up to you and say, like, they show you how your stuff plays and, and why your stuff is so good and, and if you're not the guy who can pick corners on the plate, they tell you to just throw it down the middle, aim for the middle, and, you know, let your misses take you to the corner and and just try to outstuff the hitter. So I, I think one of the things they do really well when they bring guys over is they take a ton of pressure off you and basically just, just say throw the ball over the dish and, and your stuff is good enough to, to work itself out. Now – in a personal level, what did the race tell you when you came in? And and, and what, what did they instruct you? What did they say? That, was it the pitch mix? Was it pitching to mm -hmm. your strengths? 
Um, what was it exactly that they said, hey, Colin, this is what you need to do to be, in order to be successful? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was it was really just keeping my fastball up in the zone um, and going fastball heavy, using using the breaking ball when I needed to, um, ideally using it more than I've used it in the past. But um, I, I did have a good understanding of, of who I was as a pitcher before, um, knowing that I needed to throw the ball up to get those swing and misses and stuff. So when I got over, they just kind of reinforced that, you know, this is who you are. This is this is how you're going to get guys out. And um, when you look at their track record, it's it's pretty easy to buy into what they're saying. When did you realize that that fastball of yours? I mean, I've looked it up on Baseball Savant. You throw it about 88, 89 percent of the time mm -hmm. when you were healthy. It doesn't have incredible velocity, but it gets a ton of vertical movement. Uh, was there a certain point, was it throughout college, high school, or when you got into the pro ranks where it was sort of evident that, man, this could be sort of my meal ticket to get me, uh, through professional baseball and into the big leagues eventually. Um, yeah, like when I, I didn't start pitching until I was maybe 16 and I always, I didn't throw hard at the time, but I was, I was getting guys to swing and miss. So I, I knew there was something there. Um, I just didn't know what, and then I kind of got into college and, um, you know, got away from it. Um, you know, coaches have their agendas. They have, they have certain ways they want pitchers to pitch. Um, I was in an organization, a program that, um, wanted guys to throw sinkers and sliders. Um, so I was messing around with the two seam for a couple of years and obviously just couldn't, couldn't get it right. Um, and then once I got to DBU, we had a pitching coach, Wes Johnson, who's actually the pitching coach with the twins now. Mm. Um, and he was the first one to introduce me to track man and everything. And, and he, you know, I throw my first bullpen off, off Tommy John and he's looking at the numbers and, you know, he's like, these are special. He's like, you got this crazy vertical break on your fastball. And it's the first time I'd ever heard that. So I'm thinking, Oh, vertical break. Like I'm, I'm sinking the ball pretty well. I'm like, finally, I learned how to sink it. And then, you know, so I'm messing with the two seam again the next day. And he's just kind of like, what, what are you doing? Like, this is not not who you are and so he finally told me like it's it's vertical break going the other way like it's going up almost and so you know at then i kind of learned that it was it was different but um even that year and into my first year of pro ball i didn't rely solely on my fastball like i do now i think um i think my first full season in, in pro ball 2017 is kind of where i figured out the fastball is special um just just you know, I was, I was in the low 90s, 90, 91 in extended spring training, and I was just striking a ton of guys out. And so I knew, um, you know, I knew I knew there was something there, but it's it's just tough to it's tough to convince the people that that plays at the next level. So that was always the issue was, OK, you're in extended, you're throwing fastballs by hitters, but like mm -hmm. it's not going to work when you get to a ball and high A. And then, you know, you hear the same thing like, oh, well, that big jump is double A and like those hitters are going to be able to catch up to it. And, you know, in my head, I thought, you know, no way they're going to catch up to it, but um, it's hard to convince people on the outside until you actually do it. So really the only way, because it's not 99 on the radar gun and, you know, all those, all those numbers that, mm -hmm. that pop out immediately. So I really just had to kind of go prove myself and, and prove that my stuff played no matter, no matter where it is. And, um, you know, I think I did that for the most part. Um, once I got to the big leagues, I probably overexposed the fastball a little and uh, need to get back into a little bit more of a mix. But um, the fastball is definitely not going away. The percentages are always just going to be high just just because that's who I am. And, you know, I'm not going to not going to try to be someone I'm not and potentially, you know, get burned on something that's not my best pitch. So when I go out there, you know, there's not a huge secret on what I'm doing, but I have a lot of conviction behind the fastball and I trust I trust it when I throw it. Now, how does that work if, let's say, the, the fastball is still going to be the, the major pitch, obviously? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe it was 88, 90% uh, of the time that you, did, that you threw it mm -hmm. in 2019. Uh, let's say if you step back a little, are you working on a new pitch after Tommy John? Or is it just like, no, I'm just going to you know, do what I've always done, just reverse the splits a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it's more so do, do kind of what I've always done. Um, you know, my slider, I'd never thought it was like, it was that great. But as the year went on in 2019, I started to throw it more and it was starting to look pretty good. And, and that's something even the Rays had told me is, you know, they look at all the numbers and they say that it grades out pretty high. So they're, they're wanting me to use it more. So I think, um, 
you know, I think if I get in that 70, 75% usage rate with the fastball, that's probably a good spot for me where, you know, the slider still keeping them off their toes and everything and keeping them off balance. But, um, ideally, you know, I think a curveball, a big, a big 12, six curveball would pair really well just with that heater and kind of give them something to think about. But, um, that's kind of honestly always been the pitch that's gave my elbow issues. Um, when I, when I tore my UCL the first time it was, you know, it, I started throwing a curveball that year. Um, and then even a little bit this year, my, my, or the, in 2020, when I hurt my elbow again, my slider, um, I was starting to just get to the front of the ball with my fingers a little, and it was mm-hmm. on track, man, it was showing more of like a curveball slurve profile. And so, um, that's when I started to hurt again. So I'm thinking there's something just like with the extra supination of the wrist is like when I get, I'm trying to get it in the camera, when I get more to like this position, it, I don't know if it exposes my elbow or the muscles that protect that ligament kind of turn off when I get to too much supination of my wrist. So, you know, if on paper, it would be a really good pitch mix, but it's, it's something I'm definitely not willing to play with anymore. <laughs> You know, th- th- that's a shame. I, I was yeah. going to say, you know, you've got a pretty good curveball there in your teammate, mm-hmm. Tyler Glass, who unfortunately yeah. is, of course, hurt. Right. Maybe conspiracy theory. Maybe curveballs uh, are a tricky, tricky pitch. Could be. Could be. I, you know, they always say, like, breaking balls aren't good. And, and you know, there's, there's research showing that, um, you know, the fastball is actually the most stressful, just the amount of force that is put on the elbow because it's, it's thrown the hardest and everything. But... You know, I, I have my theories on on I I do think curveballs are probably the most dangerous and sliders there. Just um, those those forearm muscles that protect your UCL on the fastball, they're able to stay on there. But you know, my theory is kind of when you turn your wrist that way, you're not able to pr- use those same muscles to protect your forearm. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't. I'm just kind of throwing throwing darts in the dark there. Right. But that's, that's <laughs> through my experience, at least with curveballs, that's been always the most you know stressful on my elbow but um i don't and that i don't think anybody really knows and that's that's the issue and that's it's also a dangerous thing even for me to say oh curveballs are dangerous when i really don't know but there could be something to it i'm sure in the future as technology continues <laughs> to grow and thrive that that's going to be sort of the next wave for professional mm-hmm sports teams and pro uh, baseball organizations is figuring out what really causes injuries for particular types of guys. So uh, Colin, going back a little bit. So you started becoming or developing uh, as a pitcher at 16 years old. Is that right? That was, yeah, that was the first time I really started pitching pretty seriously. Um, When I was young, I just, I was always smaller than everybody and I didn't throw hard. So, you know, no one really put me on the mound. And uh, I was thankful to have a coach in summer travel ball who who saw potential in me just just through the way I threw the ball, even though, you know, the velo wasn't there. And he was kind of, you know, the first person to tell me, like, at the time it was like, I think, you know, you can be good enough to pitch in college. Mm-hmm. And so at the time that was what I wanted to do. And so I, I ran with that. And, you know, I'm really I'm really thankful for him because, you know, who knows if I didn't have that influence in my life, if I would have been pushed towards getting on the mound because – I sure I know I sure wouldn't have made it as a hitter. <laughs> yeah, that was my question is, you know, growing up who you idolized or or grew up watching, I guess, was it more of a a hitter out there in, in pro baseball or, or a couple guys out there? Like, yeah, who, who so, was kind of your role model growing up? Yeah, I grew up in Dallas. So I was a big Rangers fan. Um, Michael Young was my favorite player growing up. But uh, I always tried to idolize Vladimir Guerrero. Um, just I, I, you know, I liked how we played right field. Um, I was probably like the worst player. So I always got stuck in right field too. So I was like, if I'm going to do anything in right field. I'm going to be like Vlad Guerrero. So I was wearing 27, you know, and I took a lot of pride in trying to throw guys out from the outfield and stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, those, those two were definitely my favorite. And I definitely, uh, you know, I took Vlad Guerrero's style of swinging at every pitch I could, <laughs> like just not as successful as him. Is that one guy you would have liked to have faced, uh, you know, if if the opportunity would have come, uh, a, a Michael Young, a Vlad Guerrero? Is there somebody that you would have been like, man, I really would have tried to get my fastball up at the top of the zone to Vladdy? I, I, I would feel more comfortable pitching to Vlad Guerrero. Just mm-hmm. just the free swinging guys who they look like they don't have an approach. They seem they're a lot easier to deal with than, you know, someone like Michael Young who's – you know, looking to work the at bat and doesn't swing at pitches out of the zone. You know, those, those guys give pitchers a lot more, a lot more issues. Um, you know, guys like 
Alex Bregman and, and Michael Brantley is like the big one to me is like, mm-hmm. he may be not as dangerous as other hitters, but it's just the most frustrating at bat because he knows what you're thinking. And like, he doesn't swing at pitches off the zone, but if you throw it over the middle, he's going to do damage. So if I had to pick one, I, w- I would much rather pick the v- pitch to Vladdy than Michael Young. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Now talking about you pitch and being on the mound, take us back to that MLB mm-hmm. debut. Uh, what was it like? Uh, you know, I I, I talked to, uh, to to Cody Decker uh, uh, on the show last week about mm-hmm. this. Uh, you know, I love those videos. I'm a sucker for those Twitter videos of an mm-hmm. of, of a minor league guy getting the call. I'm the Wander Franco call up. I mean, yeah. any call up. I'm just like, oh man, like I just mm-hmm. like, wow, that must be so cool. Can you take us back to that moment? What was it like? Who told you? Who was your first call? Like the emotions, everything, and then finally walking in Fenway. And being like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I'm a major league pitcher. Yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. We were we were in Gwinnett. Um, we just finished BP. You know, getting ready for a game. Everyone's in the clubhouse. You know, getting ready, playing cards. And um, Brady Williams just kind of comes out, the manager, and makes makes an announcement in front of the whole team, and is like, he kind of like calls my name, and I look, and he's like, you're going to the big leagues. And then you know, everyone starts cheering and everything, and. Um, like I didn't know what to do at first. Like I didn't know who to thank or whatever. But um, so then I, I started packing up my bags, got outside. I called um, my my wife, my girlfriend at the time. I called her. I called my parents, my brother. Um, just told them to you know get the get to Boston as quick as you can. Um, and so it was it was just everything happened so fast. You know I'm on a plane that night. I'm in Boston. Um, the next day was even more hectic. We had a double header but I was only getting called up for the second game. And so it was one of those double headers where like, there's only an hour between games. Uh, and for whatever reason, there's like an MLB rule, like you can't show up unless you're actually activated on the roster. So I couldn't show up until the first game had ended. So I'm sitting in, in the hotel in Boston, you know, with my family, just kind of waiting. Um, eighth inning comes around. I'm like, all right, like, you know, we're only a mile and a half from the stadium, but I'm sure traffic's pretty bad. Like I'll, I'll call an Uber. So I get in the Uber and some something was going on in Boston that weekend, a big parade. And so the streets are packed. Uh, I'm sitting in the Uber and I'm not moving and I'm just watching the game on my phone. You know, eighth inning goes, ninth inning goes, the game ends. I'm still in the Uber. So the game ends and I, I start, I go, I say, okay, the game next game starts in an hour. So I start the timer. And I'm sitting in the Uber, like watching the map, looking at the timer and 10 minutes go by and I, I went like a quarter mile. The next five minutes go by and I hadn't moved. And I look and I'm like just under a mile from the stadium. I've got my, my huge raised duffel bag. Um, they had just emptied Fenway Park. So all 45,000 people at the game. Oh, are- oh, oh my God. God. This is giving uh, me an ulcer. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. I'm, I'm sitting in the back of that car and I'm thinking I'm, I'm not going to make the game. They're just going to send me back to AAA and I'm never going to get called up again. And this is, this is my story. This is how it ends. No. So I just look at the Uber driver and I'm like, man, like I'm going to get out. I'm just going to walk it. So I get my huge duffel bag and I just start, I'm basically sprinting. I'm probably power walking, but I'm, I'm, I'm hustling. And the fans are all going the opposite direction. I'm carrying my huge, you know, baby blue raised bag. I couldn't stand out anymore. I'm trying to, I'm like pushing people out of the way. Um, I finally get to Fenway, you know, maybe 30 minutes to the game. and I'm looking for the clubby to let me in. He lets me in and he's like, dude, like, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you so sweaty? <laughs> like, I got sweat just dripping off my face. Oh, no. And so, like, they rush me in, get me a uniform. I get dressed. I go on the field. There's maybe maybe 10 minutes till game time. You know, I play a little catch, warm it up. Like, I'm the starting pitcher. And, uh, you know, we ended, up, we ended up using an opener that day. And so, Ryan Stanek was starting. Uh, he goes like an inning and a third, and then they bring me in in the second inning. So it was like I show up to the ballpark, and literally within you know 45 minutes to an hour, I'm I'm on the mound in Fenway, making my debut. And at the time, I w- it was so stressful, just just hoping I would get out there. But you know, looking back now, I think everything was so condensed that it, it might have helped me stay calm because I didn't really have time to like be nervous or freak out about what I was doing. It was just you know. I was more worried about getting dressed and on the field in time. So <laughs> it was it was very stressful, but um, you know I threw I threw pretty well. I was happy with the way I threw the ball that day, and I just 
you know, the, the moments after, after I pitched, just sitting in the dugout, you know, staring at Fenway. I'd never been there before. So just being in Fenway on a Saturday night for the first time as, you know, they're singing Sweet Caroline and everything. It was just, it was just perfect. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything about the way it happened. And it's a, it's a pretty cool story to be able to tell. Yeah, like, can we get a police escort next time? For yeah, guys that are making their major league debut. <laughs> Something like that had to bring you back down to earth a little bit. Like, it's little league. Like, hey, mom's dropping me off. I got to run to the park. Yeah, I'm like, gonna get there in time. Dad's got a meeting. Mom's gonna, you know, yeah. take you to the subway. You <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> open the van doors and throw you out. Hey, get to the game. Exactly. Um, by the way, when you were walking to Fenway Park and you had the raised duffel bag, did were there? I mean, we know how Boston fans can be. Mm -hmm. Did you get any hate or anything or anybody making any comments as you were – I mean, they probably say, oh, this guy looks like a big dude. I don't know if I want to mess with him. But, like, what? any comments or any looks or anything like that? Or, or you were just kind of in a, I'm trying to get to the ballpark. I don't yeah. care. One track mind sort of the deal. I got a, I got a couple of weird looks. Nobody really said anything to me probably because I was moving so fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did tell people, I was like, you know, thank God I don't play for the Yankees. Like, I don't think they would have let me made it to the mm. stadium if I was carrying yeah. a Yankees bag through there, you know. But – um everyone was nice no one really said anything i saw a couple of people just kind of looking at me like i was stupid but i was that was probably because i was sprinting <laughs> yeah <laughs> now uh that rest of the the year uh, turned out to be a pretty good season for for, for the team go mm -hmm. to the playoffs what is it like to in the same year of being in the minor leagues then get to the playoffs like how does do, do you do you just like you're saying there it was so rushed getting to the ballpark that it didn't it didn't make sense for you to even be nervous about the moment about mm. your debut. Is it the same thing throughout the season? It's day after day, day after day, and then boom, you're in the playoffs, and then you're like, oh, afterwards, you're like, holy crap, I was in the playoffs. Is that yeah. how it was? Um, you know, once we actually got to the playoffs, it felt more like a normal, just a normal game, and I I think it's just because the whole month of September we were in that tight wild card race. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, especially the last two weeks, we had, you know, a lot of games against Boston, um, teams where we were competing against for that last spot. And so really the just the games, the whole month of September, there was that sense of urgency that that, you know, we're in a playoff race. And so kind of every every game down that stretch felt like like it was a playoff game. So um, I think that was really beneficial is just you you felt by the time you got to the playoffs, you felt like you had been there before because you were you were playing with that mindset um, for the last month or so. Um, but I mean, there's so many guys who, you know, get called up and they're stuck on bad teams for so much of their career. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a bunch of good players who don't even see the playoffs for, you know, however long. And so yeah. to be thrown into that your first year, I mean, that's, that's all you can ask for is a, a chance to go out there and compete on the highest level like that. And, um, you know, the, the wild card game against Oakland and then the five game series against the Astros were, are still just some of the most fun, games I've played in just just the atmosphere and the electricity in the stadiums and um you can't get that anywhere else so um that's that's what I'm looking forward to the most this next year is is getting back into that environment to a point where we can compete to get to the place we want to be you talk about the electricity you talk about uh the atmosphere Obviously, we know as race fans, uh, we get a pretty crappy reputation of the attendance talk and mm -hmm. all that stadium stuff. But can you talk about the positive of those yellow, you know, towels waving in October? And there's something about the trop that when you're in the playoffs in those seats, in those blue mm -hmm. seats, it's just loud. Is it as loud when you're on the mound, when you're on the field? Can you hear that thunderous claps and yells and 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 and? and just ecstatic uh, atmosphere from the crowd? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Trop in the playoffs was was one of the loudest stadiums that we'd been in that year. And, you know, we were playing in Dodger Stadium, Yankee Stadium, where they're getting 50,000 people. And, and you know, we had 35,000 at the Trop packed out, and it was it was as loud as I'd heard. And, you know, it's it's definitely something you, you feel and you feed off of. When you're on the mound, you can feel the buzz and feel the energy. Um, you know, in some of those games, I was, it was late in the game and, you know, everyone's standing up and all you can see are the yellow towels waving. And mm. it's just, it just, man, it's just an awesome feeling. And you definitely, you feel that all the way inside and it, it definitely helps you, helps you, you know, adrenaline wise and, and just, you know, wanting to get the job done for everyone. But, um, 
you know, just with all those people there in the dome, you know, the sound's not going anywhere. It, it definitely gets loud and, and closing some games out when the game ends, you know, that's, that's still just one of the loudest I've heard a stadium be. Uh, how much is the trop, I guess, from your perspective or vantage point pitcher friendly, like how does that, does that benefit you at all in, in pitching in that dome compared to other places or other ballparks you've pitched in? Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I think it, it definitely seems to play. I think it's pretty neutral, but I think it leans probably pitcher friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think just with all the other teams in the division, it, it makes it seem much more pitcher friendly. You know, you go to Yankee Stadium and it's 310 down the corners and, you know, you got Fenway with the short wall and you go to Baltimore and the ball just flies. So it's definitely it's definitely the best place in division to pitch. And um you know, you walk into the stadium from the parking lot and it's 100 degrees and you go inside and it's 72 in the air condition. So um, that's definitely nice. But um, I've always really loved pitching there. Um, I feel really comfortable in the dome for whatever reason. It's just a comfortable like the backstop and the backdrop behind home plate, uh, which is a big thing for pitchers. It just it looks like you're you're pretty close to the to home plate. And so I think that helps guys, too. And um, just the comfort level of being at home is definitely helpful. Mm-hmm. And and speaking of comfort level, uh, you know, a lot of people, we, we've gotten this before where there was so much criticism with Mike Zanino and his lack of offensive numbers at times, but I don't think people quite grasp the defensive side and what he brings to the table. And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, this year offensively was, was insane for him, of course, but just previously, um, just how does he provide comfort and balance to a pitching staff? Can you just kind of underscore his importance and how he helps the team and and the team win. Yeah. So he's huge. He's, he's the motor to the pitching staff, you know, without, without him, the whole thing doesn't work. Um, You know, for one, he's so good defensively. Mm -hmm. Um, He's a big guy. So he's a big target back there. And he's, you know, he's, he's one of the best frame pitch framers in the game. And so when you're, when you're talking about, you know, stealing strikes, Mm -hmm. that's changing at bats. That's, that's changing everything as a pitcher. You know, we're always taught, you know, if you throw strike one, here's what happens in the at bat. And it usually goes in your favor. And, you know, um, one one counts that that next pitch is the most important because the swing between a two one count to a one two count changes the whole at bat. And so when you got a guy there who's stealing strikes like that, that's something to the normal fan that that goes, you know, unnoticed. But when you're doing, you know, stealing strikes consistently over the course of a season that it makes your pitcher so much better um they have so much more confidence just knowing that you know he's going to help you out back there um and plus he's he's you know he's been there he's been he's been around for a long time he's been a really good player for a long time and so when he talks you know we listen and and we really trust really trust what he puts down back there when when he puts down signs i don't think too many guys shake too often because he's he's so locked in and in tune with what you want to do as a pitcher that um you can tell he takes so much pride in it and so i've always said you know what whatever he does offensively is just bonus because Mm -hmm. what he's doing behind the dish is just so valuable to who we are as a team um you know our game is run prevention so it's pitching and defense and you know you can't find two more important defensive positions in the pitcher catcher relationship so um i'm really happy with the offensive season he's had it's obviously helped him contract wise going forward and you know obviously the power he has has always been there so for him to piece it together is just just really awesome to see as a pitcher because you know we know he invests so much defensively that over the years he's probably had to you know put the offensive stuff in the back seat for a little just just mm-hmm. to focus on on pitching you know he's in every pitching meeting with us so he's handling so many extra responsibilities that um it's just really special to see what he was able to do at the dish and you know get the all-star selection and everything and and um you know, we're so excited to to be able to have him back again next year because he's just he's really is that important to our team and, and what we're trying to do. When you talk about comfort level, you talk about pitchers meetings, you talk about the trot being a place that you like to pitch at. Us fans, we don't really get the behind the scenes of a day in the life of a major leaguer. So can you entertain us and go from a, what time do you get up on a day where you're in a homestand? 
what's your morning like? When do you go to the ball game? What do you do when you get to the stadium? Mm -hmm. What happens there when you come back home? Can you take us through a day in the life of a major league pitcher? Yeah, yeah. So first, I think most guys probably sleep in during the season. Um, you know, the game games are long. They don't start till seven. So you're you're getting home late, um, especially some of these bullpen guys. Like once you get home, you're either you're either really locked into the game and like you didn't pitch or you pitched. And, you know, either way, your adrenaline is so high that um, once you get home, like it's just impossible to shut it down and, you know, go to sleep that early. So um, that's why a lot of these like when you have those day games after the night game, like guys are dragging just because you physically can't get to sleep. You just have so much energy still. So for me personally, you know, I, I sleep in a little, maybe like nine or 10, um, get some breakfast, head over to the field. We got to, if we have a seven o'clock game, I usually try to get there at like one, um, grab some lunch. You know, if, if I need to go in the training room, get anything done, do, do that then. If not, you know, go into the weight room. I have a, like a, a foam rolling and stretching routine that I like to do before we go out and play catch. And then, um, so usually we'll go play catch. Um, the hitters will take BP. Um, everybody comes back inside. If And then, you know, we'll have a food again then. Or um, we'll have, especially if it's the first game of the series, we'll have a big pitchers meeting, pitcher scouting meeting, where we go over all the hitters and, you know, how we want to attack certain guys and, and basically what the game plan is for the next three or four games. Um, and then, you know, if you need to lift, get it in then, or just some other, like, maintenance work. And then, you know, probably everyone probably shuts it down. You have like an hour before the game kind of chilling. And then, um, you know, maybe about 30 minutes before game time, I like to just kind of like hop in the shower and kind of just refresh and restart everything and and then get dressed and go out and hang around the bullpen and wait for your name to be called, basically. Um, that's great. Now, I want to dive into something you've now mentioned twice, pitchers mm -hmm. meetings. Can you take us through that? I mean, is, is that a bunch of brochures that you guys are giving out with graphs and, and equations? Like, what does it actually look like? Um, is it a lot of savant stuff? Or is it, like you said, the race make it easy, simple, and it's very digestible stuff? So, yeah, all the all the graphs and charts are basically handled behind the scenes by, you know, the scouting department and the pigeon coaches and stuff. And, and that's all, like you said, geared toward keeping it simple for guys. Um because you can't be out there thinking about, you know, scouting reports and, and all that. You just got to have that knowledge in your brain just because competing by itself is hard enough. You can't be, you know, focused on other things. So in the meetings, they, they cover all the hitters that they have. Um, you know, they'll point certain guys' weaknesses out. Um, you know, this guy really struggles with breaking balls or, you know, this guy is actually one of the better breaking ball hitters in the league. And, um they show us you know where we can where we can attack this guy and so it you know as a reliever especially you know we have so many guys with specific skill sets you know like me with my fastball or mm -hmm. you know whether it's someone like Chaz Rowe or Colin McHugh with their slider like so just kind of going through those meetings you get a good sense of what batters you're going to face that series mm -hmm. Um, which is another big thing the Rays do is just with pitching alone, they they put guys in situations that are are suited to their abilities better than other teams, and so they they set you up to succeed before you even touch the mound, before better than other teams do, in my opinion. Um, so those meetings are big. They give you a really good idea of, you know, say the two, three, four hitters can't handle a high fastball. I I know, I know when that part of the lineup comes around, you know, I, I need to be a little more prepared and a little, you know, have a game plan ready to go and stuff. So, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, they, they, they keep it really simple. Um, you know, throw strike one, throw strike two and get them yeah. to chase is basically the motto. So that's, that's what we stick to. And, and, you know, we've had a lot of success doing that. Yeah. It, it's funny hearing Colin explain that it now makes a little bit more sense where we go back sometimes and play armchair quarterback of, Oh, why didn't Kevin cash or the team put in this guy in this situation? You know, there's not the de facto closer role necessarily. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of makes sense. Maybe you do have to look a little bit deeper and realize this pitcher, while his ERA on the year may not be as good as this other guy, he, his pitch shape and repertoire is better suited to, this type of hitter. And, and I think that kind of, right. You, you kind of underscored that a little bit. Um, Colin kind of following up on that. 
Uh, Kyle Snyder, how how has he helped you develop and grow as a pitcher and just what he provides from a coaching perspective? Yeah, he, he's great. Um, I think one of the things he's really, really good at is just pouring confidence into guys. Um, you know, when you're doing your side work, you know, in between games or like, you know, before BP, you're throwing and, you know, you're touching the mound and, and you know, just getting your feel out there. He's just really good at, you know, basically hyping you up without without overdoing it. And, and like you can tell it's genuine. He comes from a genuine place. And so he just does a really good job of making you feel good about like what your stuff is and who you are as a pitcher. And then, um, you know, on the other side of it, he's he's also really good at um, – if something's off, he can fix it really subtly. Or if there's something you want to develop, whether it's, you know, I want my slider to get more horizontal sweep or, you know, this and that, like I'm not staying behind my fastball and it's, it's running instead of staying straight. He's, he's really good and really, you know, tuned in on each guy and how they move and, and how they create the movement on their pitches that when something's off, he can, he can pretty much fix it right there. Mm -hmm. um and so he just there's so many things that he does that that keeps everyone confident in their abilities that is just is underscored for sure do you all ever talk about or joke about the number of mound visits he makes because i know that's been a running thing on social media and during the course of the game or is it just like we we don't even realize it we're just kind of too locked in or zoned into the game or i guess you really don't mind it like you'd rather have the the pitching coach come out and talk to you if 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 able to but i know that's been something where it's like oh man kyle snyder coming out again another mountain <laughs> visit what's going on here i i haven't i haven't actually you know thought of that from the inside i haven't really thought that he makes a lot of mountain visits but um you know i would i would say that when he goes out there it's it's usually for something he see either sees something or you know you're in a jam and he's going out there to really just give you a breather. I think that's mm -hmm. probably 50% of the the meetings is he's going out there so you can you know slow your heart rate down, slow down and reset, refocus, and go after the next hitter because that's one of the biggest the biggest dangers is is you speed the game up and you know next thing you know it's two hits in a row and then you walk a guy and everything's happening so fast and so he's he's really good at the timing of of picking his spots to go out there and slow a guy down and then um i would be interested to see the stat on what batters do after his mound visits because i would have to imagine they're pretty successful that would be a pretty cool thing to have on yeah. savant yeah. or fan well graphs, you something know? tells me the rate of proprietary analytics yeah. system i think they've probably got that in the bank somewhere. yeah colin could get this information from yeah. the front office yeah yeah i'm sure it. i'm not the first person to think of it <laughs> there we go yeah um speaking of coaches kevin cash of course winning his second straight manager of the year award um something that few i think bobby cox is the only other guy mm -hmm. to be able to do that and he and kevin cash in particular is the first american league manager to be able to do that winning back-to-back -back awards like that uh can you just kind of we we know and, and we've talked about you know the the in-game managerial moves that's something that we can you know see on the television and and uh see reading articles but what he does behind the scenes that makes him a special leader a coach mm -hmm. and uh just bringing some some calm levity and and uh fostering a good atmosphere in the clubhouse for mm -hmm. over the course of the season just what he provides in that angle yeah it's it's great he, he keeps everything really loose um you know he he is a trash talker <laughs> but he you know he he's able to take it he gives it out but he's able to take it and i think that back and forth you know can make make things seem not as serious and, you know, it's a little more playful. So, um, you know, guys are having fun, you know, him, him and Wendell are all, we're always ripping on each other. So <laughs> it's like, he just, he knows how to keep it really loose, you know, and everything. And um, you, you see him out there like hitting ground balls with the fungos at infielders and, you know, he's hitting them as hard as he can. And, and you can tell <laughs> like he just loves what he's doing. And the players feed off of that. You know, you can you can tell when a manager like wants to be out there with the team and wants to be doing all these little little you know tasks with the guys. Um, and he just he just really keeps it light. And you know, over the course of 162 games and you know a seven month season, like that's that's one of the biggest things is is how do we not focus on how much of a grind it is, but but how do we make sure we're having fun and enjoying being around our teammates? And I, I think he does a really good job of fostering that. Now we've talked about baseball savant, so I kind of think I know where you're headed with, with 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 this answer. But when you look at traditional stats, when you look at analytics, where are you in that camp? Are you one 
the other, or you just use both. Because as a pitcher, you know, you have the, the big jumbo screen or mm-hmm. jumbotron telling you, this is your thing. This is your, you know, all these stats. Where do you land on that? Um, you know, I, I'm probably somewhere in between. I, I do, you know, I, I think ERA, it has its value, but I do think it's a little overrated. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, it's just the facts. That's how many runs you gave up earned runs per nine innings. So while it doesn't tell the whole story, I do think it's a big, a big picture, big piece of the puzzle. Um, there's a lot of advance, I guess. I mean, K percentage and walk percentage, I think are probably, probably the biggest ones to me that just, it shows you that, you know, you're doing the things you can control. Mm -hmm. And so those two, and I think FIP is really big because, you know, at the end of the day, once, once the ball leaves your hand, like that's your part is done. So, um, you know, it can be easy to get caught up in all these numbers. And I do think a lot of these advanced stats are really good for, um, you know, evaluating players. But when it comes to our side and, and the, you know, the act of actually going out there and performing is, is you can get so caught up in, you know, too many of these numbers that it, it can almost take away that, that killer instinct of competing that got you there. Um, and so I think that's an easy trap to fall into is you get, you know, you get caught up in, oh, you know, I, I struck three guys out, you know, who cares that I gave up two runs today? Like, you know, this and this were good. Like, um, at the end of the day for us, it's about, you know, everything has, all your energy has to go into that process of making the best pitch you can for that single pitch and then basically repeating it. Um, you know, once, once I leave, once the ball leaves my hand, I can't control the hitter. If he swings or takes it, I can't control the umpire. If it's a ball or a strike, if he puts it in play, um, I have no, no control over whether, you know, my shortstop makes a play or, you know, the outfielder makes a play. So, um, I think all those numbers are good, but I think it clouds a lot of players' judgment and it, it takes away from from that competitive instinct that got you to the level where you're at. So you definitely have to find find the right balance of in the moment, focusing solely on competing, and then you know, maybe after the game taking a, a honest evaluation of yourself through the analytics and letting letting that guide you to what what you need to work on, you know, going forward. Yeah, I, I love I love that because it goes even after that with the ERA. Let's say that the shortstop can't make the catch, mm-hmm. but you know the scorekeeper also has to make a decision. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. like, if if he deems it to be a hit, now you're gonna get get stuck with that. So, Colin, let's say, unfortunately, this will happen to everybody. It it, ha- it happened, you know, to to uh, Koufax, Bob Gibson, right? You have a bad outing. Mm-hmm. Okay, you go home what's the mindset there? Is it, how do you evaluate yourself when things didn't go exactly right? Um, so for me, I, I try to figure out, you know, what went wrong before I leave the stadium. And then, you know, once, once you get home, you, you really just got to flush it because it's, if you carry that with you, it's not going to help you the next day. You're probably going to pitch the next day. And if you're thinking about the bad outing, that's, that's how you snowball it and get into a slump. But, um, you know, it's just, it's just that brief moment after the game of, of figuring out why you struggled, you know, did I not throw enough strikes? Did I throw too many strikes and too many, you know, non-quality strikes? So it it just all, it kind of boils down to what, what you particularly struggled on. You know, there, there are games where you go out there and you give up, you know, two or three runs, but it's like, man, I made my pitches. You know, I had a couple balls fall in a couple tough bounces and, and you know that um, your process was right because you were you were making the pitches you wanted to make but you just didn't get the results so it's 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 kind of finding finding you know what you did wrong and and why you didn't have success and and learning from that and and sometimes there's nothing to learn from your outing sometimes you just you know you had a bad outing and that's as a reliever you might go out there 70 times you know you're going to have bad ones and there's there's not always a definite oh you should have done this and and that so it's it's really just kind of filtering out Filtering out, you know, what's what's useful from the outing and then kind of getting rid of the rest. Right. And kind of tied into it, but not completely. I, I was always curious about this with pro ball players or pro athletes in general, um, especially around the trade deadline. Like, are you guys looking at rumors that are out there online and on social media? Like how much inside the clubhouse is there 
man, there's rumors that Kiermaier might be on the move or there, there, th- this player is being talked about, that player is being talked about, or mm-hmm. there's negativity out there from the fan base about a particular player or a move or something like that. How much of that is discussed at all within and amongst players? Or is it is there kind of a directive out there of, hey, you, you just during the season – you just got to kind of separate yourself from the noise and you got to try to ignore that stuff as much as possible. Otherwise it'll, it'll tear you up and it'll eat you up. But um, I didn't know how much of that you guys focus on of uh, the, the outside noise, basically from fans, media, whatever it may be. Um, You know, we hear it. We definitely hear it. We definitely, we definitely have conversations about some of the stuff depending on what it is. Um, You know, basically in the clubhouse, if you're on the road or even at home, you know, MLB Mm -hmm. network is always on a TV that you right. can see. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty impossible to ignore all these trade rumors and this and that, but I, I don't think too many guys get too caught up into it. Um, definitely, definitely not to the point where it takes away from what they're doing on the field. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I think late July, once you're getting to that trade deadline, you know, there, there is tension in the clubhouse just because, you know, as the Rays, they're an aggressive team. So mm-hmm. they're, they're not going to balk at chances to make the team better. So Um, There is a little uncertainty where it's, you know, maybe it's you or who are we bringing in or who's going out. But um, it's just another one of those things at the end of the day that it's out of your control. And so we talk about it and, you know, we kind of address it and move on because it's it's just ultimately it's it's nothing we can do about it. So if it happens, it happens. And um, we we know now with the Rays, basically, if there's a move we make, it it's probably going to work out for us. So, you know, we have a lot of confidence in the front office and everything. So when they do go out there and make a splash that, you know, we believe that it's going to be for the best for the team. Uh, do you, I mean, during the course of the season or off season, are you aggressively reading or checking in on, on certain baseball websites like fan graphs or baseball perspectives, baseball, America, MLB.com, the Tampa Bay times, or is it just kind of, if it, if it comes to me, it comes to me. I didn't know how much you're actively seeking baseball news and, and updates uh, during the season or, or off season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I follow, you know, a lot of, a lot of those accounts on Twitter and stuff. So if I, mm-hmm. I see like an interesting article or something, I'll read it, but um, I don't really go out and seek it out too much. If it's something interesting, then, you know, my dad or someone will usually send it to me <laughs> and I'll, I'll read it then. But um I mean, now I would love to read some stuff now, but every everything's been so quiet with the lockout. Nobody's writing anything. There's no mm-hmm. there's no moves to be made. So it's it's a little it's a little dull right now. Yeah, you brought it up the lockout. I mean, <laughs> did you see did you see Collins' uh, face? It looks it it, it yeah. doesn't look the same that's anymore. Right. His profile pic. Yeah, yeah, his avatar doesn't look quite like he does right now. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. dynamic that's happening. Well, uh, speaking of that, from from your perspective, Colin. Um, are there is there a certain consideration or considerations for the upcoming CBA that you think really need to be addressed from the player side? Is it increased minimum salaries? Is it expanded playoffs? Is it guys having the ability to get to free agency more quickly? Is it trying to stop with the roster manipulation, service time manipulation? Is, is there something or a couple of things that like, man, this really needs to be fixed before we resume play in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think, you know, for on the player side, I think one of the big ticket things is, is like you said, getting guys into arbitration quicker, mm-hmm. um, free agency sooner in their career, because the teams, the way they're running it now is guys' careers are shorter. Um, I think, I want to say I saw a stat where it's like 70% of players are, are within, you know, zero to three years of service time. Mm. And so you have the majority of the players in the league are getting paid the minimum. And then, you know, by the time they do get to arbitration and free agency, they're, they're getting replaced by, you know, guys who are younger in terms of service time. And so I think that, you know, I think if, whether it's the minimum going up or, you know, guys hitting arbitration sooner um, I think personally, the one that would probably have the biggest thing is, is I think now it's, you know, you need so many days of the season on the big league roster for it to be considered a full season in mm-hmm. terms of arbitration. So what a lot of these teams are doing is, is they just, if they send you down for a week or two, you know, here and there throughout the season, that adds up. 
And so, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you were in the big leagues for so long, but then, you know, you were sent down for maybe a month throughout the course of the season, then it doesn't count as a full season. And so if you do that, you know, a couple of years in a row, as you can option guys for three years, then it, it turns basically, you know, that guy was a big part of your team for three years, but now he has, you know, maybe two years of service time. And, you know, he's still a year away from arbitration and, you know, a few years away from free agency. So it, it's kind of creating a backlog of players who are, you know, guys aren't hitting free agency till they're 32 years old. And by that time, nobody's getting contracts because everyone knows, you know, that the secret's out about guys regressing as they get older. So I think the Players Association, one of the big things is is getting money in guys' pockets earlier in their career because the game is trending towards, you know, guys having shorter careers and, and you know, them – somewhat manipulating service time to keep guys away from arbitration and this and that. So to me, I think that's one of the the big things that'll help guys going forward. Um, And, you know, I, we, we hear like, you know, we're being selfish and we're arguing over money when we're making a lot of money, but you know, something like that, like now that we're already in the system, it's, it's not going to affect me personally. Mm -hmm. I won't, even if they change the rules tomorrow, like I wouldn't be able to take advantage of that. It's right. It's about kind of setting up the game going forward and, mm-hmm. and realizing the way the game is trending and kind of reacting to it to make sure it's kind of fair for the players going forward. Did that happen to you? I can't recall um, before you got hurt if the Rays had called you up and then sent you down for one reason or the other. Did you have that roster shuffle at all of going from Tampa Bay to Durham and then back to Tampa Bay? Or once you got called up, you stayed up until things happened? Uh, no, it hasn't. It hasn't happened to me. Um, but, you know, it definitely happens um, in our organization and in every organization, too, really. It's not, you know, it's not a raise issue. Right. It's not, right. you know, it's it's a league wide thing where guys are, you know, getting shuttled up and down 12 times a year and, and you know, they're not getting service time for that. And it's just, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're 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 using that last roster spot as kind of a revolving door. And that's it's hurting a lot of guys. It's hurting a lot of careers. And and, you know, that's the other thing is, you know, when we say we make good money is like just a couple of weeks in the big leagues extra can change a guy's life. And so mm-hmm. when you're sending guys up and down and up and down, you're, you're, you know, messing with with what some of their potential future livelihoods and stuff. So um, and that's going to be a tough one because you know, on the flip side, if I was in the front office's position, I understand why they're doing it. I understand why the moves are being made. And if it was me calling the shots, I'd, I'd probably be doing the same thing. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's really not like a greed issue or these guys are bad. They're bad people. It's just, it's just a systemic issue where the system is set up that way. And, and it just probably needs to be changed to make it a little, a little more fair for everybody. It, you know, it happened last year. 12 times with Lewis, Lewis head. head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lewis head up and down and up and down. So like it does happen, and, but it, it, you're right. It, it, it is a systemic issue. It's a, it's a league wide issue, yeah. but mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, people are looking at the CBA as a savior, like, Oh, we're, they're going to save baseball, but it's, it's tough to imagine that they're going to do more than a couple of things, you know, right. and, and the ish, it's not going to, not, ev- not everything is going to be fixed it's what is going to be fixed. Right. Yeah. Right. It's about the small victories, but I think that's, what's worrying people now is, is, you know, there's so many things being argued over and, you know, from what I've heard is the conversations hasn't, haven't even started. And, you know, we're five, six weeks away from, you know, when pitchers and catchers are supposed to show up. And so for them to not even be engaging in those conversations yet is a little worrisome for me. It just doesn't doesn't seem like we're trending in the right direction as far as all that goes. Is your player rep Tyler Glass now, correct? Yes, he is. And that's it. He's the only one, correct? Right, right. Yeah, we just have one. So how does that work? Is there a, a, a big group text uh, on WhatsApp, Facebook? Like, how does that work? The Because I, I can't imagine that Slack. Tyler – Yeah, Slack. Can um, – <laughs> you know, does he, is not going to individually text the, right. Yeah. So how does that work? Yeah. So we, we have a group chat with everybody and, um, Tyler does a really good job of, you know, letting us all know what's going on. Um, so the players association, they'll have their own meetings and Tyler will be in on it and then kind of send us the summary or the players association and MOB will get together and, 
you know, Tyler will send us like a big summary of all the talks and everything. So um, he does a really good job of uh, making sure everyone's informed and up to date on what's going on and, and, you know, getting everyone's feedback before going back to the players association to kind of, you know, just get a, a general feel of, of where we're leaning on these issues. So, yeah, it's just a big, big group chat where, you know, it's been pretty quiet lately, but, but um, yeah, that's usually where we get all the information. Is that something you would like to do in the future? Be a player rep? I would. Yeah. I, I do think it's really interesting and I think it's a, a good way to get in and um, you know, be able to affect the game and, and just help players out going forward. I think it's something, you know, as I, I, I think I need more years in the game just to mm -hmm. understand the ins and outs and, you know, there's so many like little rules and just like little unwritten rules and traditions and stuff that you just have to be in the system for a while to get a feel of what really goes on before I would, you know, feel comfortable stepping into a role like that. Yeah. And as far as the player rep goes, I'm not sure if I'm totally familiar with this, but how is that decided or voted upon? Is it before each season that whoever's on the 40 man roster, or the 26 man roster, they, they put together a voter or is some uh, does a player nominate Tyler Glass now and then a vote is taken just do you do you understand that process at all because I'm not really sure about that honestly yeah so I do believe it it's either every year or I think it's every two years unless your player rep you know leaves the organization and I think mm -hmm. every two years you nominate anonymously nominate players you think would be good at the job and then if there's multiple nominations you vote on it um but I think I think you know, we basically just kind of like renewed Tyler as that role. Like he does a good job. And so I don't think we really even had to take a vote on it this time around. Yeah. Um, Colin, you touched on it briefly. And I think this is something that is, you know, I, I think the real hardcore baseball fans understand this, but something that is maybe a little bit of a misconception out there uh, that, you know, every pro baseball player is a millionaire and is loaded with money and is is rich beyond belief. And that's not really true, especially with uh, if you do some reading and digging up what some of these minor leaguers, what many of these minor leaguers are going through. And, and I don't know about your situation personally, Colin, but I know as a 14th round draft pick uh, coming out of college, I, I, I don't know how much leverage you had at the time to, to get a, a monster signing bonus, but you know, whether I'm sure you've seen it running through the minor leagues that there's guys that are sleeping in their car. There, there's guys that are, you know, scrounging together, mm -hmm. uh, nickels, dimes, and quarters to buy a, a McDonald's sandwich, like, selling solar panels sometimes <laughs> and then yeah. the luck to be picked out. Right. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, um, that, that I, I feel like it, it really kind of hit home for me that for, many guys or some guys that that couple weeks in the big leagues can be life-changing money and can be a life-changing situation for themselves and their family because not everybody uh was a first round draft pick and got a five million dollar signing bonus mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's definitely tough on a lot of guys you know there's there's countless stories about a guy drafted in the late rounds who spends six seven years in the minors before you know getting his call up and and um, I mean, it's tough on guys. You do see some guys struggling. Um, I know a lot of guys in the off season have to work almost full time jobs just to just to make it make sense. But um, you know, I think I think we're trending in the right direction when that comes. You know, MLB announced that they're gonna provide housing for all minor mm -hmm. league players, yeah. which is just one of the the biggest stressors as a minor league player is finding housing, and then you know you get called up and it's finding housing there, and, mm -hmm. and just, you know you can't sign a lease a six month lease to an apartment when you know you might be gone in a week so um it's tough and and like you said there's a lot of those guys where you can get called up and you can spend a week in the big leagues and make more money than you would have made all year in the minor leagues so it's definitely it's definitely big for those guys and um you know that is the one aspect is when that when those guys are getting shuttled up and down there's there's a few guys who are you know getting that opportunity to make some money for a few days you know, so that is good, but, um, it's definitely tough on guys. Um, and you can, you can definitely see like when they do get called up, just that, that relief of, you know, you spend a week in the big leagues or two weeks in the big leagues and, you know, maybe you don't have to work that full-time job in the off season mm -hmm. and you can dedicate that time towards getting better and staying on a big league roster the next year. So, um, I think that's a big, a big pressure for guys, but I think that's something that, that, you know, can be handled pretty well. 
Yeah, and I not to like make this a Lewis head episode, but man, 12 yeah. times back and forth, just not just the the pay difference and the pay gap in that, but just like I couldn't imagine trying to do my job and trying to perform at the highest level possible if I'm having to do the planes, trains, and automobile situation, mm-hmm. just like mentally, physically, and emotionally. It, it would have to be drained. I don't know if Colin, you're able to speak to that at all, but I, I imagine there's got to be some talk within the clubhouse of, man, I got sent down. Now I'm getting called up. Now I'm getting mm-hmm. sent back down again. Like what? Uh, I, there, there's a lot of uncertainty there, I guess. Yeah, it's it's really hard. It's really hard to be in that role and do your job well, just because mm-hmm. you, you can never get comfortable in one place. You know, you're always up and down. Um, you're on the mound, maybe even thinking like, I'm going to get optioned after the game mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. – you know, there's a lot of relievers, they go out there and they they pitch, you know, an inning in two thirds and they're sitting in the dugout and, you know, they come out and tell you, hey, you're going back out. And so, you know, as a reliever, that means you're you're not going to be able to pitch for three days. And so they're mm-hmm. going to send you down. Mm-hmm. But you have to deal with that mentally. And and it's just it's really tough, you know, not not being able to kind of have a permanent home. And and there's certain instances where, you know, you're getting options no matter what you do. You know, if you go out there and strike out the side for two innings straight, like it doesn't matter. You're still getting sent down. But, um, you know, one, one thing I can say about Lewis is, is the, the, at the dude's attitude was just, you know, out of this world, he was so positive. And, um, you know, I remember someone kind of making, I can't remember who someone made a comment to him like, Oh man, like you're going up and down so much, like that really sucks or something. And, and, you know, his response was, this is the best year I've ever had. (laughs) <laughs> like, i'm in the big leagues like yeah even if it's for a day here or two there like this is this is as good as it's ever been so i think um he he you know handled that really well there's been guys in the past um austin pruitt went through that a little bit where he was getting sent up and down and and he just handled it so well and um those are the guys that when they go to other teams you see them stick and have success because you know guys know that they're invested in what the team is doing and and they're going to be a team player but um at the end they just they just have the right attitude for for what it takes to get the job done now of course we hope that lewis head has a great season with the miami marlins yeah. Maybe, joey wendell too yeah joey wendell hey that's nice for <laughs> yeah. them to to, to be and avi garcia and paul campbell and <laughs> yeah. who else was a former ray player that is yeah. now on the marlins yeah. the, the, the floor the, the florida team um yeah. You know, let, let's shift back to 2022. What are your expectations for 22? How, where's the rehab process going? When do you expect to be on the mound, sweating, getting get, getting that ball, and and looking at Zunino's fingers and saying, "All right, fastball, let's go." For me, it's day one. I'm I'm ready. Um, I finished up my rehab in in mid October. Um, I was down in Port Charlotte doing uh, the instructional league. Um, so I was able to work with some of those guys and, and got some innings in, you know, maybe nothing crazy, maybe five, six, seven innings down there and got to a point where I felt really comfortable with, with the stuff I had. I, I felt like, um, I felt like the stuff I had was ready to compete at a high level. And so, um, I'm really excited now because it's, it's just back to being a normal pitcher. You know, when spring training comes, I won't, won't be on the rehab schedule or anything like that. I'll just, I'll just be one of the guys, um, you know, competing for innings like everyone else. And um, that's all I can really ask for right now. Do you have any certain metrics or goals laid out for 2022? Is it, I want to hit this number of innings. I want to have this certain ERA. um, Or I just simply want to be able to stay healthy for the entire year. Do you have any kind of big range goals planned or, i think he's or, more of a fit guy yeah fit. I think he's a, whatever he's a fit guy. Guy. yeah or, or strike out the walk ratio like i want this certain uh-huh. number this is what i'm targeting or looking at for 2022 um i mean obviously health is just obviously number one after missing so many years and and it's just being out on the field is is so important you know you can't provide any value on the il so it's it's really all about staying healthy and um you know, as far as metrics go, not nothing, nothing too crazy. I, I would like to see my my fastball velocity be at least you know where it was in the past. Um, that's just a good like a good good reminder that you know I, I'm where I need to be, and the thoughts of you know my elbow holding me back is gone. So, um, but there's no stats, no no innings or anything like that. It's just really about making sure I'm, I'm healthy and, and ready to pitch day in and day out just to give myself the opportunity to put up those numbers. 
Yeah. And, you know, kind of looking big picture macro level here, we, we kind of touched on it a little bit with the CBA and some of the issues that need to be resolved. But as far as the game as a whole, the sport as a whole, MLB as a whole, um, what do you consider or think is the biggest issue plaguing the game right now? Is it pace of play? Is it a uh, need to better market the game and market the players? Is it the there's seemingly an issue or there is an issue with too many teams tanking and not enough of a competitive balance there. Is, is there something that you've noticed as a player from afar? That's like, man, they, the, the league really needs to figure this out one way or the other. Yeah. I, I think the two big ones are, are pace of play and the competitive balance. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's such a long season. And when you, when you have 10, 12 teams that are out of it by June, like it just, it kills the sport. Because it's so many, there's so many games that you know ultimately don't matter to that fan base, and so I, I don't know what the solution necessarily mm -hmm. to that is. Whether it's you know making teams spend money or you know um, reorganizing how they do the draft order to you know provide incentives to win. There's there's something in there that's going to take us mm -hmm. more in that direction. But I think that's a big one to just make sure all the teams are using all their resources to put the best product on the field. Um, and then the pace of play, man, I, I just, the games are, they're long, mm -hmm. and they're, they're slow right now. And, and, you know, as you guys know, the big three, the walk strikeout and home run are at higher levels than they have ever before. So it's, it's less, it's less entertainment for the fans, less things going on. And, um, I don't know what the solution is to that. I, I do think that there's way too much time between pitches with, mm -hmm. you know, hitters stepping out they have their routine and the pitcher has his long routine and he's got to get the signs and then you know the batter calls time and the pitcher steps off and it before you know it it's been a minute and a half and you know nobody's made a pitch and then he bounces a breaking ball in the dirt and we gotta get a new baseball and it's mm -hmm. just it's been five minutes and there's still one at bat going on and i just i don't know i i think something has to be done there to to keep guys in the box and keep it moving um, because the walks and strikeouts and home runs, like that's, that's part of the game now that's not going anywhere. So like, what can we do around that to keep people more interested? Um, and I do think another, another big issue is we, I personally don't believe we have it with the Rays with, um, Dwayne stats and Brian Anderson is, is the team's broadcast. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times they're, they're filling that air with either telling personal stories or they're, they're honestly kind of you know crapping on the game of how it's being played mm -hmm. and like on the flip side like you could focus more on the chess match going on between the hitter and the pitcher and you know talk more about hey, here's what the pitcher's trying to do to get the hitter to to see this and look at this sequence he made and you know even just just taking some of the trackman data and like putting that on the tv and talking about it and like you know showing Tyler Glass now look at he's got this you know seven and a half foot extension towards home plate and that makes his 99 look like mm -hmm. two and I think there's so many there's so many more things that would interest younger fans mm -hmm. that just need to be talked about and I think um you know my experience just like working out in different facilities with with track man and stuff is the younger players they eat that stuff up you know mm -hmm. it, it makes it more of a game like you see guys hitting on like the hit tracks machine that shows you in a cage how far you hit the ball and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like the guys love that stuff, the young kids. And so I think that's one way to get them involved is to just, you know, speak on all these, all these new things that are coming out. And, you know, I think we have a lot of broadcasts around the league that just aren't willing to do that or aren't informed enough to do that. And so it, I think that makes watching the game a little, a little more dull. Yeah, I that's a great point, Colin. I think uh, after your baseball career, production assistant, <laughs> uh, running a, a Bally Sports or Rays Radio uh, broadcast, yeah. I think that might be in your future. But and I think some of that could go back to you have teams that are tanking, or uh, mm -hmm. let's say the Orioles or the Rockies, a team that's not like by May, all the wind is out of the sails. It's like, what do we talk about for the right. next? five months here and oh let's talk about that guy who's eating a hot dog how funny yeah, is that yeah and then you're just doing that for the whole half inning essentially yeah so well, i cedric mullins who's pulling up a 2020 season yeah right and, and yeah. i think we can go back to it a little bit one of our i mean one of my best or most enjoyable baseball watching experiences one 
I, I don't praise ESPN a lot, but when they introduced the the nerd cast where they brought in <laughs> all the, the the specific uh metrics and explained yeah. them and, and mm-hmm. why this why this is important, why uh why this is a big deal. So that that's a great point, Colin. And and I think that is something that has to be uh addressed more more going forward in the game. They have the tools, they have the resources. Use it. Use it. Use it in the broadcast for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um yeah. Another another thing, uh, again, you don't necessarily have to go deep on this or anything like that, but uh, we know there is a, a stadium saga. The, the split city scenario is coming up. It's 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 gaining steam. It's it's been talked about. It's been written about. Uh, it's, it's it's thorn on the side. That's one way to put it. Um, but is. Do you as players, is that something you all have talked about uh, when an article or a report comes out? Or do you guys kind of take the perspective of, let's be honest, you know, six, seven years from now, whether the, the team is playing half its games in Tampa, half its games in Montreal, whether they're playing in Nashville, whether they're, you know, whatever happens. Ebor, tw- Ebor yeah, for 81. There, there we go. <laughs> okay. uh, 2028, that we're, we're probably not going to be a part of the organization. Like how much thought or consideration is given to, um, what is happening right now with the stadium issue and, or is it a distraction for you guys? Another thing that you have to think about, um, from your perspective. Um, it's definitely not a distraction. I don't okay. think, um, I, I, like you said, like it's pretty far in the future. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, realistically, like most of the guys on the team now won't be there except obviously wander. <laughs> yeah. He's, he might be the guy. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not something we think about. We've definitely talked about it. Um, I, I do think it provides a lot of challenges, obviously having to pick up and move in the middle of the season. Um, but if if that is something they go forward with, then you know it, it won't be done without them having concrete answers on on how they're going to get that done. Um, personally, you know my my opinion is I would I would love to see you know the Rays stay in Tampa in the area. I think it's just you know it's a good a good spot for them. You know, we have a lot of, we do have a lot of fans. Um, I know I'm sure you guys have, have talked about it, but if you look at the TV markets, you know, we're, we're top 10 in, in people who actually watch the game. And yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there are ways to get more people involved and in, um, at the games, you know, whether that's having a stadium that's more central to where, you know, the bulk of the population in the area is or, or whatnot. But um you know, the other side of it is I, I also know that there's so many challenges that go into that, whether it's, you know, funding and finding a location and everything. And I'm pretty out of the loop on all that. So it's it's a little hard to, um, you know, definitively say, like, this is what they should do. But I, I ultimately think, you know, baseball in Tampa is a good thing and, and it can work. It can work for, you know, a full season. Well, that'll bring a lot of smiles to Ray's man's faces, I'm sure. I'll tell you, I, I, I imagine, you know, a, a, a Yankee series, Colin shuts it down, mm-hmm. the ninth inning, gets a save, and then afterwards he goes to a cigar bar. And he goes, <laughs> Love it. Wouldn't that be nice, Colin? <laughs> Maybe just a quick drop in to say hello, but <laughs> there you go. There we go. Um, all right, Colin, we, we've kept you for a while here, but we do want to go through a couple uh, quick hitting uh, questions and answers here. Just a uh, quick first thought that comes to your mind and, and we'll go uh, back and forth with, it, uh, with this. So first off, um, within the Rays organization, who is the the funniest guy that you've encountered? Brett Phillips, 100%. I got my baseball is fun shirt on. Hey, right here. look at that. Love the dude, it. The dude's funny all the time. So it's it's not even a second thought. Hey, G-Man by the way, can you put my, my runner up? He's pretty funny too, but I mean, you can't, you can't touch Brett Phillips when it comes to entertaining Okay. As a follow up to that, uh, can you put a little line into Brett Phillips to come on the podcast? We've been like needling him. We're, we're not trying to slide into his DMs too much, but we'd like to try to get him on at some point. And, yeah. And he must be a busy man with the t shirt line, I guess. But be, it is yeah, his I'm doing my part here with the shirt. So, you know, it's pretty nice. It's I'll, pretty I'll see nice. what I can do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, number two, most athletic guy in race organization. Most athletic guy, probably Kiermaier. Um, mm. Just so fast, um, can run, jump, just the instincts. You know, I, I think he's definitely up there. Um, maybe overall in the in the past, Avi Garcia was probably mm. just one of the biggest freak athletes I've ever seen with just how big and strong he was. And then, um, you know, his sprint speed was like in the top 10% in the league. And yeah, 
just the things he was able to do. You know, he, I saw him basically hit a ball off the roof of the trop and then leg out a triple like the next day. And so I think that dude is probably one of the bigger freak athletes I've seen in the game. Yeah, and there's probably a reason why. I would, I would also awesome. like to throw Glass now into that mix as mm. well. Because when you can do a backflip and yeah, you're like what six, six nine, yeah. yeah. And I've seen him. The dude works so hard. I've I've seen him like running, and he's just he runs like a gazelle. He runs. He looks so fast that it's just that dude. He looks like he was created in a lab to play baseball. Yeah. No, I I, I don't want to creep anybody out, but he looks like you know he was sculpted by Michelangelo. That, yeah. That's kind of the situation that we're dealing with. Even that helps. with the injury. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Saying, he could have saw... picked one. He could have picked athletics uh, uh, or yeah. the looks. He he picked both. <laughs> and. And and Colin mentioned uh, Kevin Kiermaier, so I'm officially jealous because he's not only the most athletic guy, arguably, in the Rays organization, but also probably the best-looking guy with the eyes and so forth. So he's got that going for him. I'll, I'll leave that guys. up to you guys to decide. There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know what objectively or, or factually speaking, he's one of the highest, if not the highest-paid player there you go, within man. the Rays organization as well. Um, okay, so um, – I'm not going to say smartest guy in the Rays organization because it'd probably be one of the uh, research and development leaders or nerds in there, but uh, smartest player in the Rays organization. Um, I'm going to hate myself for saying it if he hears the interview, but Pete Fairbanks is probably one of the smartest dudes on the team I've met, but if he hears it, it'll definitely go to his head. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he uses it, you know, yeah. uh, with the crazy yeah. eyes. On the mound, that, that, that's true. I think he uh, majored in mechanical engineering or something along those lines at Missouri. I know he's yeah. like he, yeah, he's a smart dude for sure. Yeah, I tried to make a joke on him one time, and I think he said he got like a perfect score on the ACT. So I, I just stopped. I stopped yeah, after that. <laughs> Why do you say to that? Yeah. Um, okay, tough, toughest hitter you faced in MLB. Um, I talked about him earlier, but Michael Brantley is definitely the toughest mm-hmm. hitter. Um, lefty on lefty lefty on lefty so I, I thought it would be an easy matchup for me um i still remember the first at bat i had against him i i dropped the first pitch slider in for a strike and so okay. i was thinking i got him exactly where i want him next thing i know he worked like a 10 pitch walk and so he's just just one of those frustrating like pesky hitters who you just know that you got your hands full when he's in the box quick question though uh qu- quick follow-up you said 10 pitch do you remember the sequence uh not exactly i know i threw the first slider and then tried to get him with a couple fastballs and then um i think i actually got ahead in the count like one two and tried to get him to chase a good slider and probably threw like my best slider and he just looked at it and i knew i was in trouble then (laughs) okay that that's what separates like pro athletes from the average joe playing mlb the show and tweeting out that because they can remember and recall specific instances like yeah. we had Cody Decker on a couple of weeks ago and he went pitch by pitch his at bat against Madison Bumgarner and mm-hmm. could tell you yeah, everything like certain the, the things that just stay with you for sure and you remember every little detail that's and awesome so, yeah I try to forget having to face Michael Brantley but <laughs> <laughs> there we go um so I'm not sure if you're situated in the Tampa Bay area right now, Colin, but when you are in the Tampa Bay area, what is your favorite thing to do or, or f- favorite place to go? Is it a, a particular restaurant? Is it a particular activity? What's kind of the go-to spot for you if you have some downtime? Um, so we do live, live in Tampa now. Um, we've, okay. we've had a house here for a little over a year now. Um, we've tried to kind of just branch out and try all the different restaurants. Um, my go-to place is Fresh Kitchen. I don't know mm. if you guys have been there. But yeah. As far as like a quick, healthy lunch, that's really good. Like you can't beat Fresh Kitchen. I know that they got one in St. Pete, pretty close to the Trop, and then they got a couple here in, in Tampa. So that's definitely my go-to. And, you know, I try to recommend that to everyone who's kind of like new in the area. Uh, Fresh Kitchen, get this man a sponsorship <laughs> or give him free meals for the next year. I've been year. trying. Like, I've been trying something. <laughs> the garlic parmesan broccoli. That's that's yeah, that's good. That's the kicker. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you got to try that. Um, okay. Besides the trop, of course, is number one. Which ballpark do you like to pitch uh, the, the best at? Um, I, I think I think Fenway has been my favorite so far. Hmm. Fenway was really cool, and and um. Dodger Stadium also was pretty special. 
um, just like the environment they have and, and stuff like that. It's it's you, you watch it on TV all the time, but, you know, actually getting to experience it in the stadium is just it's something else. You know, I don't Dodger Stadium is, is probably the biggest baseball stadium I've ever seen in my life. In, in 2019, when you guys went to L.A., I believe Tyler did his little comeback, like for a, a one or two innings, and then you guys had a back and forth affair. And oh, Austin yeah. Meadows actually got a home run for for, for the game winning. So I remember that that uh, that experience must have been really mm-hmm. cool in, in in the dugout. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. I mean, that the atmosphere there. They get you know almost sixty thousand people in the stands, and you know you're in beautiful LA weather and stuff like that. And the team, their their team is obviously always really good. So yeah. it's just a really right. fun place to play. Very cool. Certainly. Um, last thing, uh, you played at Dallas Baptist University, and I've always wondered this because I don't – whenever I hear Dallas Baptist University, all I think of is they're known for baseball. They're a baseball powerhouse. Do you have any insight into why that is? Like what is it about the program that makes it so special? Is it just the fact that it is in Dallas, Texas, and you're able to, to – pick on and, and sign up and, and recruit a bunch of kids from the area or just something about the program that makes it good year in and year out and produces a lot of draft picks year in and year out? Yeah. So I, I would say there's two things. Um, the first is the head coach, Dan Hefner has been there for a long time and he's really just one of the best in the country at, at developing players. And um, you know, like you said, being in Dallas, you think that would actually be a positive, but it, it kind of hurts us because mm. 30 minutes down the road is TCU. Um, You know, there's probably three or four big 12 schools in Texas. You know, there's so many guys from Texas who go to schools like Oklahoma state and, you know, Arkansas and sec schools come and and draw out of the pool. So what, what they have to do is, you know, find good players, but, but players who they can project, you know, a couple of years of, of being studs. And so, you know, they get guys in and, and they know how to develop skills over the next two, three years to turn them into, you know, really good players. And so I think, um, you know, Dan Hefner has been the coach there since they were, you know, I think they were D3. Mm-hmm. And they've been a D1 baseball program for about, you know, maybe 15, 20 years now. So um, he's done a really good job of kind of building that program up. Um, and then the other thing is, it's one of the the rare schools like you can't do it anymore, but baseball is their only division one sport. Mm. There's no football. There's none of like the bigger, you know, Ah. money money grabbing sports. So, you know, all the athletic department resources are, are kind of, you know, spent towards baseball and developing that program. So I think that that gives an advantage over other sports where it's getting more of the resources to play with. That's awesome. Well, Ulysses, I think I can uh, say this fairly, but Colin was awesome. He, I'm not going to say hit it out of the park with this interview. I'm going to say <laughs> struck him, out the side. Yeah, immaculate yeah, inning. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, there, there, you go. Go. there yeah. you go. Nine Perfect. pitches, fastball, yeah. boom. Maybe one slider. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, Colin, one. is there anything you want to promote? What what you have going on um, with some of this downtime with the lockout? Anything on social media? Uh, any any side gigs that you're doing? Just anything you want to throw out there um, that that you want to put out? Um, I don't have anything personally, but I will pull it out. Another plug for baseball is fun for okay. Brett Phillips. So, you know, everyone get out there and show your support and get your, get your baseball is fun, you know, memorabilia. And I haven't talked to Brett about this, but after my endorsement, you know, I, I think I would like a, a portion of the sales he makes after the episode's released. I think that would only be fair. Yeah. <laughs> that, that'll be our DM to him, by yeah. the way. Yeah. You owe, you owe Colin money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I got it. So portion of baseball's fun sales yes. and unlimited fresh kitchen. I think that's yeah, the, there you go. Those, that's those all things. that's all I'm asking for. <laughs> awesome. All right. I'm gonna stop this.